Hi everyone, uh, this is going to be a brief presentation on uh, the opioid drug tramadol. The reason why I became interested in focusing on this is when I learned that um, it's claimed to be a partial agonist, which I'll, I'll talk about what that means in a little bit, but it's claimed to be a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor. And um, I noticed that in some resources that's not mentioned and in other resources it is mentioned. It, what I was curious about is why, if it is a partial agonist, First of all, um, you know, why is it never used like buprenorphine, um, which is, you know, used in um, certain situations, for example, when a patient um, is basically going to be taking buprenorphine with naloxone in order to deter abuse, um, that combination product. So first of all, why is uh, tramadol not, not really used for anything like that? And second of all, um, why have I not seen it listed as... Um, a partial agonist in some resources, but in most clinical resources, it is listed as a partial agonist. And I really wanted to get down to the bottom of it because um, as I start, just started teaching it now, uh, all the opioid pharmacology, I want it to be absolutely crystal clear about what it really does at the receptors. So that's what this uh, really focused discussion is going to be about. So basically, um, so I'm starting with an introduction here. Tramadol um, is given as a racemic mixture, that means two different uh, stereoisomers, okay, as it's given. Um, it's been available for many decades, okay, at least 20 decades, maybe more. Um, it has some activity as the parent compound. That means um, as it's administered, it has some activity, but mostly that would be uh, norepinephrine reuptake and serotonin reuptake. And that's why it's kind of an, uh, an interesting opioid because it has a stronger effect on those um, reuptake transporters than some of the other opioids. However, it has many metabolites, um, generically kind of just listed M1 to M5 is what's typically used. However, M1, which is um, O-desmethyl tramadol, is considered to be the major active metabolite that is produced by a, a very important enzyme called cytochrome P452D6. And there is some evidence that mutations in that do matter. Um, it, they do affect the amount of metabolite produced and the activity of tramadol. And of course, drug interactions too are, are going to be pertinent on that trans or on that uh, enzyme. I'm not going to really focus on that because the focus of this discussion is on really the pharmacodynamics or receptor binding. So what about activity at the mu opioid receptor? First, I wanted to start off with what I saw in the clinical literature. Um, at least two of these are clinical. One of them is probably more of a basic science uh, journal. But yeah, this is just scratching the surface of what I found. If you look all over the literature, you see so many references to it being a partial agonist. Okay, so these are just a few examples. So the first one is in uh, Pain Physician in 2008. It's just called Opioid Pharmacology. I just wanted to highlight that it said, um, a unique analgesic, tramadol, is an atypical opioid, a 4-phenylpapyridine analog of codeine with partial mu agonist activity in addition to central gamma aminobutyric acid, catecholamine, and serotonergic activities. So it has a lot of, um, you know, nonspecific receptor effects. However, they're saying that it is a mu partial agonist. And remember the mu receptor, the mu receptor is the main um, main opioid receptor that appears to be related to, to pain relief or analgesia. So that's the first one. The next article is called Analgesia and Relief of Pain. That was in um, the journal Pharmacology in 2009. And the excerpt that I found uh, was a tramadol acts as a partial agonist, which creates only a partial physiological response. And this to me is one of the more important um, statements that I wanted to focus on because if I, you know, were reading that as a clinician, and I, I am a, I do have a PharmD and I do have a PhD, but um, if I were looking at it from a clinician perspective, okay, partial physiological response, that would tell me that it is weaker than uh, morphine, um, and it might leave some uh, confusion or mystery about, you know, if I increase the dose of tramadol, if I if I went higher and higher, can I eventually reach the same effect as morphine? And that's related, that's related to the term called efficacy. Okay, we'll get into that more in a little bit. I'm gonna focus on pharmacological efficacy. So um, what is the maximum response that we can produce? 
This leads me to believe that you may not be able to achieve the same pain relief or same receptor activation uh, specifically as, you know, as morphine or some of the other opioid medications. But let's get to the bottom of this in a little bit. The final one I just wanted to give as an example of what's in the literature is in Pharmacy Times 2018, Opioid Agonist, Partial Agonists, and Antagonist, oh my. Okay, and yeah, they list um, examples of partial agonists would be buprenorphine, that's what is in Suboxone, butorphanol, and tramadol, so that's also listed as a partial agonist there. So I had to believe that if it's listed in so many locations as a partial agonist, then it must be a partial agonist, okay? It turns out that what it really is, um, is a little bit more complicated than that and a little bit more interesting than that for me, okay, as a pharmacologist myself. So let's let's get into the nuts and bolts of what, what it actually is doing here. So I'm gonna get into some real uh, studies on uh, the receptor interaction, so some real pharmacology journals. So again, this is gonna be the evidence for what it really does. Okay, this is the first study um, that's going to provide a little bit of evidence of the receptor pharmacology. So actually, all three of these studies are about receptor pharmacology. So what we have to do is go back to these uh, original studies where they really looked at receptor binding and the response to receptor binding. So the activity and the affinity. Um, so, so obviously, affinity would be how strongly things bind. And then the efficacy or activity is, you know, what is actually happening after the, the substance binds. So in this first study, they expressed the human mu opioid receptor in Chinese hamster ovary cells. Now, if you're not familiar with those cells, um, that's a very popular cell type that's been used for quite a while now uh, because they're very easy to grow, very easy to transfect, um, which means put uh, a gene into, so um, an, an external gene, put it inside, and have it be expressed. So these are still these are used very very often today for expressing things like peptides, even for vaccines, even for um, other therapeutic proteins. But they can also be used directly to study the function of something. In this case, um, the function of a receptor. Uh, so th the receptor will be expressed and against the human type. It will be in the membrane of these cells, even though these are um, hamster cells, they'll express the human uh, receptor and it'll function fairly well. So they compared affinity, pharmacological efficacy, and I wanted to highlight that because that means not clinical efficacy, because efficacy, clinical efficacy is the ability of a drug to produce the desired therapeutic response. Pharmacological efficacy as a, has a very specific meaning related to the receptor, and it really means the maximum biological response that that substance can produce at the receptor system that we're looking at. Potency and then intrinsic activity. I'm not gonna spend much time on intrinsic activity, but that is something that was looked at here. And they looked at tramadol um, and its metabolites and fentanyl and morphine and um, something called, well, the acronym or abbreviation is DAMGO, and that's considered a full agonist at the mu opioid receptor. Um, in a little bit, I'm going to show I'm going to show you what the actual chemical name is, but it's quite long, and essentially it's just one of the strongest or probably the strongest agonist that's been found for the opioid receptor, the mu opioid receptor. And the idea is that is a real full agonist, um, giving the maximum biological response achievable by the system. And for each one of these, I have the reference down here. I'm going to go ahead and move on um, and show you the next or show you the, the data related to this one. So first of all, um, in this study, again, this is the same study that I was talking about. Basically, they're looking first at affinity. Um, this affinity of tramadol and its metabolites at the, the mu opioid receptor. And if in case you're not familiar, they're looking at KIs. And KIs are really um, a measure of uh, ability to inhibit the receptor. So essentially, the lower the KI, um, the more uh, potent or the better the substance is in inhibiting the receptor. That means it's the concentration of medication uh, or substance that inhibits 
uh, approximately half, that would be half of the, um, well, half of the binding in this case, okay, half uh, of the binding of the ligand that they study. In this case, they studied naloxone. Naloxone was, was what was binding, and they were um, competing with other all these other uh, substances to see which ones could prevent naloxone binding. So it's clear that morphine has a, a quite a very low KI compared to um, all these. That means it has a higher affinity. The only one that's going to be close would probably be the M1 metabolite. That's the metabolite of tramadol. And that would be the race mate. And then there's the positive isomer that would be a little bit better affinity. Okay. And they did um, two different salt conditions. And I don't want to spend too much time on that. But they show basically the same idea that um, if we just simply look at receptor binding, and that's all this is, is how well does tramadol and its metabolites, um, how well do they bind to the mu opioid receptor? And that doesn't tell you the whole picture, right? That just tells you, um, because we're looking at, these are agonists, right? They're activators. So just binding doesn't tell you a lot. It just tells you they have a stronger affinity. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, the morphine is a stronger affinity. The M1 is a stronger affinity than tramadol, and tramadol is as one of the weakest ones there. So let's move on and, and actually look at the efficacy data. So when we look at actual efficacy, and this is pharmacological efficacy again, and that means um, basically they're comparing the Emax or maximum activity of that receptor, right, compared to the activity that was achieved by the substance, right? So um, this DAMGO is a it's a real full agonist, okay? So that is going to give us our 100, right, maximum efficacy. It's 100% of the maximum efficacy. If we look at things like fentanyl, it's a little bit lower than that. Morphine is a little bit lower than fentanyl. But let's look at tramadol and its metabolites. Tramadol by itself, that's the parent compound, has almost no um, efficacy. That means it doesn't um, activate the receptor, the mu opioid receptor, that is, because it's not, um, it's not, a, not basically showing us any GTP binding to the receptor. And GTP binding is one of the first thing that things that happens after the receptor is activated. M1 metabolite, its efficacy is about 52% of maximal. That's the same as morphine. So this study is telling me, at least this one study so far, was telling me that the metabolite of tramadol is about the same efficacy as morphine uh, at the receptor. So that means that if you give, that all that means is that if you give enough tramadol, you can achieve the same response that you could, that the maximum response of morphine would be. Okay. Um, however, if we go to the right here, we see the EC50, that's, uh, basically the concentration to produce half of the maximum response. Okay, that is for morphine 118 nanomolar. For M1, it's at 860. That simply means that um, the M1 metabolite takes, it takes quite a lot higher, much higher concentration, maybe about seven times higher than morphine um, to produce the same biological response. But I don't, I don't want to focus too much on that because the whole idea here is that um, we want to know, you know, if these could produce the same maximum response. And the answer is yes. If you give enough, right, you can produce the same maximum response. So by definition, um, right, these are both partial agonists. Morphine, right, is a much lower maximum response than this DAMGO. And uh, the M1 metabolite, right, is a much lower response, maximum response. So what, what I'm getting at here is that if morphine is also a partial agonist, um, not talking about that in, in, you know, out there in the literature and in the, in the clinical realm, not talking about morphine being a partial agonist, but talking about uh, tramadol or tramadol's metabolite being a partial agonist might mislead someone into thinking that that the tramadol metabolite you know does does not give you the same effect as morphine the reality is it might then in this case it would if you gave enough right if you just gave enough of a dose
So that's the first important point there, um, one, of the, one of the most important points of this presentation. However, when you see, um, so I have one more article um, in the middle and then a final article, which um, is really good in, from 2018. It, it goes into much greater depth on a lot of these things, not just the mu opioid receptor, but the other ones. So the second study is again, uh, more basic receptor pharmacology. This is a much simpler study, but it adds a little bit of evidence to support um, the role of these substances, you know, whether or not they're um, partial or full agonists, for example. But this one only studied the M1 metabolite, tramadol itself, and then again, the, the, the full agonist DAMGO, which is um, actually an enkephalin. And here's the full name, if anyone were interested in that. This study is a little different because they use Xenopus oocytes, which are frog eggs. That is something I've actually done before where you inject uh, messenger RNA right into the frog egg. It's a very, you know, very tedious, meticulous method. Again, you, you're putting the RNA into the frog egg and then you're waiting typically two days or so for um, expression of that RNA. And the frog eggs will literally express the human protein in the membrane like they're supposed to and it will actually function for the most part, um, at least a signaling cascade, the signal transduction cascade will function correctly. So what they found in the study um, was when they measured a calcium activated chloride current, which is um, one of the things that you can measure as an, an outcome of mu, the mu opioid receptor activation, because it is a G protein coupled receptor. What they found is when they measured that current, it reached a maximum at a very different concentration for this DAMGO, the M1 metabolite um, and the tramadol. And actually tramadol and the M1 metabolite plateaued around the same point, but tramadol had a much lower maximum. So this, the lower maximum means lower efficacy, that's lower pharmacological efficacy. So no matter how much you give, you're reaching a plateau that's be below the highest, uh, plateau, the plateau of the highest um, activity substance or the most active substance, so that would be the DAMGO. So that means M1 has a lower efficacy than, than DAMGO, and tramadol has a, a lower efficacy than M1. So this supports the previous study showing that um, the, yes, tramadol is a partial agonist and the M1 is a partial agonist. Again, I want to just keep reiterating that, that that doesn't mean that you can't achieve the same pharmacological effect as morphine because morphine is also a partial agonist and it's got a similar efficacy to the, to the M1 metabolite. So it's never gonna help us to only talk about tramadol's efficacy because when you give tramadol, right, you're, you're making the M1 metabolite. So you need to know both and you need, you know, so we can't just say by looking at tramadol alone in, in that pharmacology that we can understand what's happening when we give the drug, right? We need to know everything about it. So. The main metabolite is M1, so that's what everyone's focusing on. And that is about equal, equal efficacy to morphine from what uh, we've seen so far. And this is the final study that I'm gonna talk about, um, which is a more recent study. And I was so happy to find it because, because first of all, because it is recent, and second of all, because it is so comprehensive with um, studying all the different substances and all the different receptors. Um, so this is a comprehensive molecular pharmacology screening, which I'm sorry, it's called comprehensive molecular pharmacology screening reveals potential new receptor interactions for clinically relevant opioids. Okay, and that was in, again, actually 2019, not 2018. So in this study, they expressed the human mu opioid receptor again in CHO cells, like the first study that we looked at, um, a very large amount of data on many different opioids they measured affinity with radioligin binding and efficacy was measured, which is a very common way by looking at GTP binding or GTP coupling to the receptor because um, these are G protein coupled receptors. And finally, here we have it, um, the, really the com most comprehensive set of data that I've seen on the different um, opioid agonists at, at all different opioid receptors, all three of them, Okay, that's mu, delta, and kappa opioid receptor. And really just looking at um, the potency, which is really EC50, and then the efficacy, which is the Emax.
And this is one of the most helpful pieces of data I've seen out there because it not only um, allows us to look at the medications we were talking about, but even buprenorphine, which is the partial agonist that is used in Suboxone, which we know has a ceiling effect, which limits the, the maximum you know, side effect potential and also the, the maximum euphoria and things like that. So let's start off with the ones we've been already discussing that would be morphine um, and tram tramadol. And the, the M1 metabolite is right here, this O dismethyltramadol. So first of all, let's, let's just focus on the mu opioid receptor. So if we look at morphine, um, they're showing you here that to get maximum biological response at the receptor, it's about 130 nanomolar. Um, o dismethyltramadol or M1 metabolite is 360 and then tramadol is 3100 and all this means to me is that they have very different uh, potencies with uh, with respect to receptor activation and specifically um, basic basically the, the otis methyl tramadol or m1 metabolite um, it takes a much higher concentration than uh, morphine to reach the same uh, biological response however this is absolutely critical and we're talking about partial agonism. This is the Emax. Morphine and the M1 metabolite are almost identical in this study, whereas tramadol is, is much, much lower. Okay, so that means they achieve about the same maximum response if you give a high enough concentration, right? So it's gonna obviously take a higher one for the M1 metabolite. You're gonna have to ramp that up to a higher concentration, but you're going to get about the same maximum effect. So that, that you know, kind of leads to the same question again. So are these both full agonists or are they both, both partial agonists? Because this data tells me that they have to be one or the other. And we can't separate, based on this efficacy, pharmacological efficacy, we can't separate tramadol's metabolite from morphine. Um, so, so what, what, do we, what do we call them? Well, the simple answer is if you compare them um, to essentially, in this case, um, another full agonist, that would be endomorphin. They used endomorphin 2. They got about the same result as morphine in the M1 metabolite. So that means in this study, they both might be considered full agonists. Okay, whereas in the prior study, we found that um, they were equal efficacy, but they were both partial agonists. Okay, however, the, the parent compound, like I said, tramadol, is absolutely uh, having lower efficacy, so it's absolutely a partial agonist. So if someone says, yeah, tramadol is a partial agonist, uh, just like buprenorphine, say, okay, yeah, it is, but what happens when you give it? Okay, it gets converted, some of it gets converted into o tramadol. So is that a partial agonist? The answer is it may not be. But the, the most important answer is it's about equal to morphine in terms of its maximum, uh, maximum ability, so our ability to generate a maximum response, right? So that, that doesn't mean that you get the same dose, you get the same result. It means if you give enough, you get the same result. Right, that's the most important uh, point there is that distinction between potency and efficacy. But that leads us to a final question is what about what about buprenorphine? So is is that a partial agonist? Of course, that is well known as a partial agonist. So how do we know that? If you look here, it's got a much, much lower maximum efficacy. And this is just percent. The units are just percent of maximum. Buprenorphine is much lower. That tells me it is definitely a partial agonist, but it's um, EC50, or the concentration where we get half of its maximal activity is very low nanomolar, less than 0 0.1 nanomolar, right? So we're talking femtomolar, um, or sorry, that would be picomolar, right? But regardless, buprenorphine has a, a very, very high potency, but a much lower ceiling effect. So that's why it is it's really uh, kind of, that's why it shines in, in, in what it's used for, which is um, given to people so they, they don't abuse it because they can't achieve a really strong effect, right? Um, so that's that's why it's used for that. So why isn't tramadol, like going back to that original question, why isn't tramadol used uh, 
like buprenorphine in things like Suboxone, why isn't there a similar dose uh, uh, drug product like that? And again, that's because we're seeing that really tramadol is not, right, it is not, effectively it's not going to be a partial agonist if you consider the full extent of what's happening to that medication. So let's, um, I just wanted to show you that there's again the, the delta and the kappa. Um, if you're interested, you could see the differences. I didn't really spend a lot of time looking at this because that wasn't my goal here to focus on those. But um, I think you know, if you want to use this as a reference, I think it would be great to, to be able to, to compare. Um, so just, I'll just briefly mention the relevance. As far as we know, the um, kappa opioid receptor um, is not really going to be a major opioid receptor. That means it doesn't doesn't seem to be as important as mu, and neither does the delta opioid receptor. That also does not appear to be as important as a mu opioid receptor. And in some cases, they look like they might augment uh, mu function, meaning that they have to function with it. Um, and I believe the kappa is has been shown to be associated with instead of being having euphoria, the opposite, which would be dysphoria and feeling unwell. Um, so that, that's just some information about those receptors, but I really, again, just didn't want to focus on them too much here. So in summary, what, what we've learned here is that tramadol, yes, it is indeed a partial agonist of mu opioid receptors. Its M1 metabolite is much more potent and has a higher pharma, pharmacological efficacy. However, we still don't know for sure if morphine is or is not a full or partial agonist. The, the most recent study showed that morphine probably is a full agonist. However, the M1 metabolite showed equal efficacy, meaning that would also be a full agonist. So to the best of our knowledge, it looks like um, tramadol's metabolite is a full agonist. So if you were to say, is tramadol as a whole drug, as it's given and metabolized, is that a partial agonist or not? I would probably steer away from that. Um, even though the parent compound is, the metabolite most likely is not. And even if that's debatable, it's e equal efficacy to morphine in two really, really well-constructed uh, well studies. So that means we don't want to lead anyone to believe that tramadol is lower total activity than morphine. Okay, so yes, the M1 metabolite potency is much lower than that of morphine. But the reason why potency is not always very important right, is because that just means you need to give a higher amount to get the same effect. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't get the same effect. It just means you need to give a higher dose and get a higher amount uh, or higher concentration in the system. Okay. So what I recommend here is, is that I, I say that it's not clinically helpful to describe tramadol as a partial agonist as it may give the misconception that it or its metabolite has a lower pharmacological efficacy than morphine. Okay, so that, that's the take home point there. And I think um, it's really important for this, this to be looked at in, in, as you know, truth seeking rather than, right, let, what's the simplest way to describe tramadol? More so, it's, it's more important to me to be accurate and for people to know out there, all the, the, you know, the healthcare professionals and patients to understand that it's not really, it doesn't really have a ceiling effect in terms of its side effects because it's equal efficacy to morphine which you know obviously can be quite toxic if it's if it's overdosed on so uh, thank you for listening and i hope um i hope you enjoyed this and please comment um if you have any you know questions if you have any debate um dis disagreements um either way it'd be i think it'd be really uh, kind of fun to talk about it in the comments section so thank you very much